Thanks, everybody, so much for coming. And thank you both for making time to uh, have this chat with us today. Congratulations, Moises, on the glowing New York Times review yesterday by Christopher Isherwood. He um, noted, as part of that review, that this play, that the Laramie Project, has been produced almost 900 times in the past five years. So I wanted to start by asking you why these productions right now? Well, I think that when 10 years had passed, when we, wrote the, when we first wrote the Laramie Project, um, I took the theater company to Laramie because there's over a thousand anti-gay hate crimes that are committed every year that are reported. So God knows how many other hate crimes are committed that are not reported. Um, but what struck me after this murder occurred was that it was everywhere. It was in every newspaper. It was in every television show. It was in the radio. It was in the internet. And the question came up for me about why. Why is it that now we as a society were able to hear that this was going on? Um, and what was different about this murder with, with you know, regarding to the other 999 murders that occurred, and why did we pay attention to this, and why aren't we paying more attention to all the other ones? And so the, the desire to go to Laramie was this question about, perhaps if we go to Laramie, we will be able to gather a document about not only how Laramie was, but the whole nation was at the end of the millennium. And not only in issues of, you know, hom homophobia, um, or gender discrimination, or, or, or sexual discrimination, but in terms of education and violence and all of the things that are kind of default lines in our culture. So we, we went there and we wrote the first play, and as you said, it, over the last decade, um, it became one of the most performed plays in America. And I'm not saying that to be pompous or arrogant, but because I think that, that one of the reasons why Matthew Shepard's murder had the effect that it had was because we as a society were ready to hear it. You know, I think that if the same murder would have happened 10 years before, exactly in the same way, we would have been ready to hear it. I think, you know, since Stonewall, there was 30 years of political activism. There was 30 years where AIDS occurred, where people came out of the closet, where there was an awareness that was being built. So Matthew's murders became a kind of lightning rod that attracted all of these conversations. And I think one of the reasons why the play has continued to be performed is because it allows um, communities to have this conversation. It's in the air, and the play is a kind of allows the conversation to occur in a, in a codified way. Ten years after, <clears throat> I, um, I decided that I had, uh, we had witnessed so much soul-searching in Laramie. This is a small town. It's 26,000 people, or it was then. You know, I always say that I live on 88 and West End in Manhattan. If a murder happens um, on 89th Street, I never in my life would think, what did I do to encourage a space where this murder could occur? But if it's a 26,000 people town where everybody knows everybody and two of the kids in your community commit this horrific act, the question did come up in Laramie, what are we doing in this town to allow for an environment in which, the, in which our children are, do this? So all of this kind of soul searching was so powerful uh, and the conversations that occurred in Laramie were so vibrant that when the 10 year mark came around, I thought, you know, let's take the company back to Laramie and find out how all of that soul searching has translated into concrete change. What is concrete and lasting that came out of it. And we thought when we went to Laramie that we were gonna write a 10 minute epilogue or a 15 minute epilogue to the play. We thought, oh, this is gonna be some conclusion so we're gonna attach it to the play. Well, of course, we were very naive because when you ask the question, how has a town changed? The real question that you're asking is how do you measure change? And so, trying to evaluate what were those measuring uh, methods was what made us have to write a whole play. Um, also, I tell the company that, that we wrote a whole play because we don't know how to write short plays. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but anyway, but that's a very long-winded way of saying that the reason why we wanted to do both plays now is because when we, when we wrote the second play, we opened it in 150 cities around the world on the same night, 10 years after the murder but we had never done a stage production. And it was partially because I thought that the play worked really well as a reading, but more importantly because I had never found a theater where I felt, yes, we will do both these productions and it will have the kind of air and space. It, 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 the play, those of you who have seen it or are about to see it, now it's almost five hours long. And it, 
There's a sense of this epic story of an American town over the course of a decade. So when I was talking to John Melillo at BAM and he said, why don't you come and do both plays here? That, it felt like a perfect, perfect, perfect place to do it. The Harvey Theater has been one of my favorite theaters in America for the longest time. Not to mention that Tectonic Theater is a company that creates new work. And we have been so influenced by so many of the artists that have performed at the Harvey. Whether it's you know, Peter Brook or Pina Bausch or all of the you know, great international uh, and national directors. You know that we made a play and that you're a character in it, right? Yeah, I heard about it. I heard about it, but I ain't never seen it. I don't know what I say in it. Well, it's all your words. We use your actual words from when Rob DeBree interviewed you because uh, that's all we had of yours, what was in the trial transcripts. <coughs> trial transcripts? Yeah, because when we were interviewing people, we couldn't actually talk to you. Okay. So we're going back and, and talking to our characters 10 years later, so um, that's why I'm here. Okay. And what have you learned from staging the, these productions? Um, I keep waiting for the Laramie project to feel historical, and it doesn't. It still feels like a lot of the conversations that it's uh, addressing are very, very pivotal to, you know, a kind of American idiosyncrasy and American uh, ideals. So. I think that that has been the biggest lesson, how relevant so much of it still feels. Judy, it looked like you were about to say something. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, uh, I travel a lot, and what I see are, um, you know, like I view the, the Laramie Project in the 10 years after like a microcosm of every place else in the world. There, there are the allies, and there are the, the haters, and there are the ignorant, and it's just all up there on stage. And I tell folks who haven't seen it, you're going to see yourself on that stage, no matter what you think or what you believe, but you're going to be up there. Uh, and it is still very relevant to what's happening all over the place still. Many people in this audience are going to have the good fortune of seeing these productions and seeing a company that has an incredibly unique relationship with their material and their characters. Who are they? What should we know going into these plays about your cast? Um. <clears throat> Six of the eight actors that you're going to see are the original members of the company who went to Laramie, who conducted the interviews, and who edited the material, and who created the play. Um, one of the things that, that we do at Tectonic is that we really are, are a bit tired of um, so much of the work on American stages being naturalism and realism, which are really 19th century forms. So we keep trying to push the envelope of what can happen on the stage, what can happen on the stage. And these are the, I call, I say the Tectonic Theater Project is a laboratory. So these actors are the lab technicians who are trying to, you know, create new ways of conveying, telling stories on stage. Um, it's very funny because when we started rehearsing this time around, we, we said we're rehearsing Laramie Project 10 years later. And one of the actors said, it should be called Laramie Project 10 pounds later. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that is partially true. <laughs> but I think that, that, that what, has ins what has really moved me this time around uh, in, in touching base with this material again is that it's true, we may be 10 pounds heavier, but there's also 10 years of experience and, and 10 years of craft and 10 years of living that you see on the stage. I mean, you know, these actors have been doing these roles you know, on and off for, for a long time. And I was sitting there in rehearsal, and I would hear lines spoken in ways that I had never heard them before, finding new ideas, new content, new meaning in this text. And you know, I, I love, I love obviously my company, and I love all the actors in it. But um, and I always thought they were brilliant actors. Now they're more brilliant. You know? Wait, that's Kaufman. The company has agreed that we should go to Laramie for a week and interview people. <laughs> I'm a bit afraid about taking 10 people on a trip of this nature. Just make some safety rules. No one works alone. Everyone must carry a cell phone. I've made some preliminary contacts with Rebecca Killiker, the head of the theater department at the University of Wyoming. She's hosting a party for us our first night in Laramie and promised to introduce us to possible interviewees. I must tell you that when I first heard that you were thinking of coming here, when you first called me, I wanted to say, you just kicked me in the stomach. Why are you doing this to me? 
Um, what's it been like for them and for you to live with the story for a decade? I don't know how, how to answer that question with you here. You, sh you should answer that question more than, than me. Um, I think, obviously, it's difficult to deal with this, with this for such a long time. Uh, but it has been very rewarding because you see that, pe that it speaks to people and that it encourages certain conversations that hopefully lead to change. What would you say to that question? Well, I, as you said, I haven't seen the, fo the first production. Um, I've seen the second, but not the first. But what I hear are, in particular, how much the communities enjoy the opportunity to have a discussion after they see the play. Uh, it opens the door so wide for everyone to voice an opinion, to ask questions, to try to figure out how they can help make the situation better. Um, and it just brings the community closer together. And the, the actors who've done it, the stage crews, the audiences have all told me how transformative the experience is for them, whether they're just watching it or producing it. And the leeway that you give them, that you have given them to either use eight actors or 100 actors, is, uh, is tremendous for them. I was in one really little town in Oregon, and the gentleman said, it's a little like herding cats, but um, <laughs> I, gave, I gave every person who came to try out, I gave them a role. Because I felt if they had the desire and the courage to be a part of this play in a very conservative part of the state, that they deserve to be a part of it. How do people in Laramie feel about the Tectonic Theater Company showing up once every 10 years? And <laughs> And about the play? Um, the f it, it has changed a lot. The first time that we were there, you know, we were a, a group of actors and writers and designers and directors with our little tape recorder saying, we're writing a play. Can you talk to us? So this idea that, that we were going to write a play that was going to be done in New York with the interviews, it was not tangible. And also we came at a time that was very, very, very tender because the media had just gone there. And the media had portrayed town for the most part as a town of rednecks and hillbillies and cowboys. And of course it could happen in a place like that, but it would never happen in any other town in America, was a lot of the discourse of the media. Well, what we found was exactly the opposite, that what is most shocking about Laramie is not how different it is from the rest of the country, but how similar it is to the rest of the country. And how much, as Judy said, when people go see the play, everybody in the audience will identify with a text that is being spoken on stage. Um, so we got there at a time where people needed to speak, and they needed to speak in something longer than sound bites. You know? And because you know, we would sit with people for an hour or two hours, we really needed to understand. We un un unwittingly, we were providing a space where the community could speak. So during that time, it was very, very, very good. And then when we came back with the play, people were very moved with the play, and it was, very, it was I think, very cathartic. You know? When you go to theater school, they always tell you that the purpose of theater is to achieve catharsis. Um, but that so rarely happens, in my experience. Uh, but when we went with Laramie Project to with Laramie Project to Laramie, there was a sense of catharsis in the audience because there were people told us things that they don't tell their neighbors. So you were coming to the theater to listen what your neighbors thought, uh, and it was very, very moving. And it was a and, it, and because it's so much about what the town experienced, the town was able to cry and have the experience of what they had just been through. Ten years, you know, then we made the movie. Um, and ten years later, when we come back, everybody knew what the Laramie Project was. So we were no longer a theater company with tape recorders. We were, oh, those guys who wrote the Laramie Project. And everybody was on side, one side of the fence or the other, you know, about uh, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and a lot of people after ten years keep saying, we want to just put it behind us. You know, the eternal discourse of, you know, denial and oblivion. So. I extend my most heartfelt sympathies to the family. Governor, you haven't pushed hate crime legislation in the past. I would like to urge the people of Wyoming against overreacting in such a way that gives one group special rights over others. We will wait and see if this vicious beating and torture of Matthew Shepard was motivated by hate. How did you prepare your company differently the first time you were going into a space where people were, might not even have known that they were hungry to tell the story and to talk about their feelings? And then the second time, I'm sure that you anticipated a different reaction. How did you prepare yourself for both? The great benefit that we had the second time was that we had a lot of people that we knew by that point in Laramie and who had seen the work and trusted the work and trusted what we were going to do with their words. 
I mean, there's an incredible amount of responsibility when you're dealing with other people's words, as you know. You can take a, a verbatim text that somebody says exactly as they said it and pit it against another text that somebody else said and change its meaning completely. So the rule of thumb was that, it, that, that, that if people came to see the show, they would feel that's what I said and that's what I meant. Uh, and of the 64 characters, there was only one character who was very upset when she saw herself on stage. And she was very angry, and I, afterwards I said, why are you so angry? Did you not say what, what we said you said? No, I said it. Did we change the meaning? No, that's what I meant. So why are you angry? She said, because my character would never wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> she was right. What, what kind of fact-checking did you do as part of, part of the process of putting both plays together? Well, every interview that we did, uh, the, w w after it was transcribed, um, each actor would present the character that they had interviewed to the rest of the company. And over the course of the rehearsal process, we would some certain kind of narrative lines would begin to emerge. So for example, we asked everybody, when was the first time you heard about the attack? So everybody talking about the attack became a scene, a theatrical moment. So, um, but after we would do all of that, we were always double and triple checking that we were getting it correctly. As, as you know, and as many of you probably know, 2020 did a, a very controversial report uh, claiming that Matthew's murder stemmed from his involvement in uh, the drug underbelly of Laramie more than a, a hate crime. You've referred to this as the changing of the story. When did you first become aware of this and how did your company respond? Um, well, I, I, I want to answer that question, but, but for those of you who are going to see the play, I don't want to give too much away. But suffice it to say that, um, that when we got to Laramie 10 years later, um, the first thing we encountered was that people were not as eager to talk to us for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so it took up a lot more to get down to actually having them speak to us. And the question about how has Laramie changed, we found it wasn't a very helpful question. Because again, this issue of how do you measure change? What are the specific markers that you use? So do you measure change by the fact that now there is a AIDS walk in Laramie that raises thousands and thousands of dollars for people with AIDS? Do you measure it by the fact that the high school in Laramie now it has a Grace Trade Alliance? Do you measure it by the, now, the fact that now there's a Rainbow Center at the University of uh, Wyoming? Do you measure it by the fact that there is a symposium for social justice? So that, so those are some of the ways that you can measure it, right? And there's other ways in which you can measure it in which there's several people in Laramie now who believe or who are, are advocating that it was not a hate crime, that it was a robbery gone bad or that it was a uh, drug deal gone bad or that the boys were in drugs, they didn't know what they were doing. So there is an attempt. So it's interesting because, as I said, the play ends up being, at the end of the day, about what are the narratives that we construct in order to be able to survive. And as gay people and as people in a town that needs to kind of construct its own narrative. November 26, 2004. Good evening. Welcome to 2020. The killing of Matthew Shepard was widely perceived as a hate crime because Matthew was gay. But over the next hour, you will hear a very different account from the killers themselves and from new sources that have come forward for the first time. A 2020 investigation uncovers stunning new information about one of this country's most infamous murders. You may think you know what happened, but you haven't heard the whole story. It was very shocking for me to see that. Therapy resident Jan Lundhurst. They were interviewing the murderers after they'd been in prison for many years, and I thought, well, yeah, you can change your story however you want to now. I mean, they completely changed what they had said in their confessions. Did it make you wonder at all, even given the extensive amount of time that you spent in Laramie, were there stories that you might have missed? Of course there were. I mean, there were 26,000 26, people in Laramie. We only got 200 interviews. So, but, but I don't think that the way to tell the story of Laramie is by interviewing every single person. Um, I think when we wrote the play, one of the things that we were criticized for was because the actors and the members of the company are characters in the play. And at the beginning, people felt that that was self-congratulatory. And to me... Um, I believe that this kind of document, documentary genre often 
pretends that there is that this is the these are the facts. Therefore, this is the story, right? When you see a documentary and it has a voiceover, like these are the facts. And of course, now we know that there is no such thing as facts. Is everything is a narrative. And to me, I wanted the audience to know that the people who were writing this play were some of them gay, some of them Venezuelan, some of them Jewish, some of them uh, straight. You know, I wanted to put the storyteller in the mix, and I wanted to say, look, this is not a, this is not the story. These are not the facts. This is not an objective truth. This is a very, very subjective truth of a group of theater people from Manhattan who went to Laramie and started talking to people without really knowing what they were doing. We're here from New York with a theater company. <coughs> we're here finding out how Laramie has changed since the Matthew Shepard murder. Can we ask you some questions? Nope. <laughs> One of the narratives that, that you have resisted, Judy, is, is the impulse to uh, make your son a, a kind of saint. You've always said he's, he was a real kid. Right. And um, I, I wonder, after almost 15 years of his, after his murder and his having become such a critical part of the story of gay rights in the United States and around the world, and his becoming part of so many of our stories, how do you keep your own memories of him based in reality? Well, there, there are, uh, there are a lot of things I haven't shared about Matt that, I've, that we've kept private, that we made a decision to not, to not uh, entertain the world with everything about Matt. The closest we came was when we, when we did a book about Matt, um, the meaning of Matthew, simply because we didn't want Matt to become this uh, iconic perfection of, of a human being. It wouldn't have been fair to Matt. It would, certainly wouldn't have been what he wanted. Um, he had issues with depression and all kinds of struggles that young people go through, gay, straight, whatever. And it just didn't seem fair that um, people began to view him as something that he wasn't and he wouldn't have liked that. So it, it, we didn't want young people to worry about having to aspire to that goal either. Um, that they could be who they were and still you know, come out of it and be, be complete, happy human beings, which Matt would have been given the opportunity. So uh, it became really important for us so for the truth to be out there. And that's one reason why we so appreciate the Tectonic Theater Group and the Laramie Project because it will always be one of the things that's true. It'll never be a dramatization of, of the events like so many other things that have been done about what happened to Matt that it will always ring true. So that's one of the reasons we, we, we adore the Learning Project. What are some of the most memorable responses that both of you have received uh, to the Laramie Project's productions over the past years? You start. Um, well, two, two come to mind. One is uh, because of what you were saying, Judy, about people doing the play. There was a, a production in Oakland, California. And while the, it was in a high school, and while the play was being rehearsed, a transgender girl was murdered. She, she had been so bullied in the high school that she kind of stopped attending the high school, and then there was a party. She went to the party, and three boys took her out and killed her while they were in rehearsals for the Laramie Project. Mm -hmm. So we flew out, and we saw the production, and, and this was... And, and the night that we saw the production, the, 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 the mother of, of, of the transgender girl was there. Um, and they were doing the play, and it was incredibly moving and incredibly poignant. But there is a character in the play who's 53 years old, and he's lived in Laramie all his life, and he's gay. And the boy who was playing this character must have been 13. <laughs> His boy hadn't yet broken. And so in this little voice, he says, I'm 53 years old. <laughs> And I'm gay, and I've lived here all my life, and I was very... And, and when he started speaking, at first people started laughing. And then that laughter broke into like sobbing, collective sobbing. That the laughter finally allowed this other thing to come up. But what struck me was that, you know, watching, watching any play, if, if it's, you know, anywhere from good to very good, will have an impact on you. But imagine working on a play for four weeks and living with the words of the people of Laramie for four weeks or five weeks that you're rehearsing and then two weeks that you're performing it. 
So it becomes, and I was thinking, imagine this 13-year-old boy having dinner conversations with his parents uh, about this 53-year-old man who was gay and what that life was like. And, and that's, I think, the most moving part to me, that it encourages, especially the people who do it, to have this kind of deeper conversations. After Matt was killed, I was gonna leave Laramie, but I went to the vigil for Matthew Shepard. I met Bill there. We started seeing each other, and we've been together ever since. 10 years. Everybody knows that Bill is my boyfriend, but I'm in a safe pocket, and the safe pocket is the university. I'm in student affairs. That's a totally safe place to be. You know, if I were in ag, agriculture, it would be different. Or if I worked at the cement factory here in Laramie, it's a different world. But I mean, finding our safe pockets is what we do as gay people, not just here in Laramie, but wherever we live. One of the common threads is invariably, in a high school especially, there will be one person involved with the play who decides now is the time to come out. Um, and it's, well, because he's in a family, right? So, sha. <clears throat> so he feels very comfortable and safe, uh, always, and I think that's spectacular. Spectacular. What other kinds of links have the two of you found between activism that's been uh, that's happened as a result of young people being involved in productions of the play, of communities embracing the play? What are what are some of the uh, ways people have changed their lives besides coming out because of the Laramie Project? I think kids become, uh, they become more observant of what goes on around them. The bullying becomes personal. Whereas before that was always happening to somebody else and there was no consequences. And now that they have seen this play or been involved in this play, they understand that yes, there is consequences. Um, so they've started gay straight alliances or become more involved in their uh, local LGBT center or, or anything to help young people through a, tired, uh, a very trying time. I think one of Matt's greatest um, legacies is a generation of activists and advocates that I don't think would have been moved to participate in that world uh, had Matt not been murdered in the way he, that he was. I think that's absolutely right. And you, you, what it does is allows a space where people can come and talk and speak. Um, and you know, in, almost invariably when there's an announcement that a production is being done, not so much in regional theaters or in professional theaters, so, although those two, People like Fred Phelps and the, web, uh, the, the Westboro Baptist Church, the people who have the signs that say God hates fags, they threaten to come. And so the kids, in, st in addition to mounting a play, or the ar actors or artists, in addition to mounting a play, they have to become activists. There's also a lot of places in America where uh, school boards are um, forbidding the kids from doing the Laramie Project. There was a school in California that, that the kids were forbidden from doing the Laramie Project. And so it was, it was, in, it was near Los Angeles. So they rented a theater in Los Angeles. <laughs> and they did the production with the students of the high school there. So, you know, this, this issue of arts and activism and arts and social justice, um, there, there, there are many theater, regional theaters around the country that have had protests right outside their doors because they've done the play. Um, so I think that, that it is part of, what it does, it allows people to speak. And when, when those kind of conversations are occurring, change occurs. Did you have any idea when you were working on it that the Laramie Project would have this kind of life, that it would touch so many people? You never do. You never do. You can't. I mean, before, before the Laramie Project, I had written a play called Gross Indecency, The Three Trials of Oscar Wilde. And when I finished writing that play, I sent it to about 20 agents, uh, and they all turned me down. And then I sent it to 20 theaters. And they all turned me down. They said, oh, Oscar Wilde, really? Who wants to hear a story about Oscar Wilde? <laughs> and that, that play ran for two years in New York and did very well. <laughs> and I got an agent out of that play. <laughs> and so when I said to my agent, you know, this thing has happened in Wyoming and I want to go out to Wyoming, he says, really? <laughs> like, you're going to write a play about this murder? Do you think anybody's going to want to go see that? Uh, and again, even when the play was done, we took it to several theaters around the country and nobody wanted to touch it. Really? So, I mean, some of, some of them because of homophobia, some of them because they didn't think it was a subject matter for a play. You know, God knows how many reasons there were for it. But uh, you can never tell. 
Judy, I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the Matthew Shepard Foundation. And I was particularly hopeful that you would talk about the uh, its recent work on the close vote for civil unions in Wyoming. Well, <laughs> I, I wish I had better news there. Um, the good news is that the Wyoming Wyoming is one of the few states left that does not have an amendment to the Constitution defining marriage as between a man and a woman, which they tried to do last year. Uh, this year, we, through our uh, legislature, which I understand is a supermajority Republican, and there's probably total House and Senate 100 members. Only 500,000 people live in Wyoming. So um, we have more sheep than people. So, uh, <laughs> so, it was, so it's kind of hard. If you, if you run for office with an R behind your name, you're more than likely to get elected, no matter what the rest of your life is like. Uh, but nine Republican legislators approached Kathy Conley, who is a character in the Laramie Project, openly gay um, representative from Laramie, about introducing bills into the legislature, one for domestic partnership, one for marriage, and an anti-discrimination uh, bill. Well, Wyoming is a right to work state, so the anti-discrimination was sort of a, it, it wouldn't have done a lot to change things in Wyoming except for state uh, employees, but it was important to the discussion. The gay marriage bill was more like the adage, if you want a kitten, ask for a pony. Um, <laughs> thinking that if we go all the way and ask for marriage, maybe they won't be so shocked or reluctant to talk about domestic partnerships. Uh, both failed, but they did make it out of committee, which is the first time ever that's happened. And they did both lose, but not by much. So that is a huge step forward for Wyoming. And the discussions were very much uh, more passionate towards passing the legislation than defeating the legislation. So that was a, that was a huge step forward for us. Um, we know we're getting there. We're not moving any faster than any place else in the country. And when you're rural, when you're a flyover state, when nobody lives there, when you don't see diversity as part of your everyday life, it's a much more difficult uh, subject to address. But we are, we're getting there. We're not as fast as some, but we are getting there. What is the relationship between the Matthew Shepard Foundation and the, the Laramie Project? Well, we are, uh, we're fans. Um, <laughs> we actually have a staff person who is a dedicated uh, Laramie Project specialist. We get a lot of requests for assistance in uh, identifying characters, finding them, talking about what Laramie is like, um, and it's the uh, Moises group. So it's, we just try to lend support. And um, a lot of young people, especially high school students, want to know what they can do beyond their production of the Laramie Project to make things better. So we try to encourage them to get involved locally in the issue and, and try to give them some uh, information and background and, and support in any way that we can. It's one of the only things that we endorse fully, because as I said earlier, it's one of the few things that is the truth. Uh, so it's, um, it's been, I actually think one of the reasons that, that we are still talking about Matt is largely because of the Laramie Project. And can we anticipate the Laramie Project 20 years later? Uh, I was working with a very young assistant director this time around. He said, so are you going back in 10 years? I said, no, you are. <laughs> Judy Shepard, Moises Kaufman, thank you for your storytelling and your bravery.